on June the 30th, 1998, in Saint-Étienne, France, a drama was about to unfold that few would ever forget. England versus Argentina in the World Cup would decide the last eight, but more importantly, it would settle a score between the two nations. This was a fixture with an edge, sharpened by past and unforgotten conflict. Expectations really, really high. They don't come much bigger, really, than, than that game, and especially after 86. For me and the Argentinian people, football is more than passion. For example, I love football like I love my mum. This was not just a football game, this was also a very political game, and it was a historical game because of the history with England and Argentina before. I mean, England and Argentina has become, I guess since the Maradona kind of hand of God instant, has become almost a replacement for the England-Germany games that I guess used to be or whatever. In England, the nation was buzzing with anticipation. Offices and streets emptied early, as everyone made sure they were in front of a TV set. I'll certainly be watching and uh, everyone's going to have their fingers crossed and hoping England do well and we're, we're, we'll be right behind them all the way. Are you watching the match tonight, Mum? <laughs> I don't know what time it is. Eight o'clock. Oh. Will you be cheering on party. England? Well, I think one should. In the ground, the players tried to ignore the hype and concentrate on the contest ahead. You just try and be as, uh, as relaxed as possible and, and try and savour the atmosphere, really, because it's, it's not very often you play against Argentina in the World Cup and uh, in such a big, big game. Football is art at its best, and great World Cup matches are absolutely compelling art, as good as anything you can see in the cinema. This was the Citizen Kane of football matches. Argentina! Argentina! The carnival atmosphere around the stadium was transmitted to a global television audience of a billion people. I was watching the news and there's this man waving a walking stick around and I said to the dog, look at that silly old fool with his walking stick. And I said, oh goodness, it's your father. A uh, few seconds after taking part in the conga, I said to my son, I've lost my money and my match ticket and membership, England membership card. I mean, my, my dad was, was panicking and I, I, you know, we were both upset really. The money didn't mean anything. I wanted to actually see the game. <laughs> Fortunately for Dennis, an English copper was able to get him and his son into the ground. Meanwhile, with black market prices reaching £800 for a £30 ticket, six lads who'd travelled from Blackpool were starting to give up hope of ever getting in the stadium. So we kept uh, trying to get tickets until about 10 to 8, 10 minutes before kick-off. Uh, Realised no chance of getting a ticket, didn't want to miss the start, so we got a tram back into the square. We needed to get to watch the game and we knew the big screen wasn't on because we were worried about trouble. And we got out at St Etienne Square and we were looking everywhere in all the bars, all the bars were shut. We looked around, we found this one little bar. So all the lads got off, got off a tram, about 30 of the English fans that had come away from the ground with no tickets. We all congregated out there and it was a 14 inch portable all the way to France to see England against Argentina and we ended up seeing it on the portable telly. Inside the ground, the English fans gave a rousing reception to the arrival of reinforcements. We wanted to be the England mascots, the three lions and St George. And as we walked in, you could see the heads turning. They, they all began turning and we got this huge round of applause as we walked in. So it was absolutely magnificent. As the eight o'clock kickoff neared, 36,000 spectators in the stadium nicknamed the Cauldron waited anxiously for their heroes to emerge. The way the whole country got behind us, you know, we, you know, we all knew how important it was, you know, not just to ourselves, but to everyone back home. So actually being a World Cup 
one step away from quarterfinals, playing against Argentina and France, it's, it's what boys' dreams are made of. We just asked them to be in that tunnel, put your chest out, you're representing your country in a World Cup game, and um, to go out there and, and really impose yourself on the opponents. It is such a great, great moment to actually lead your, your country out um, in the World Cup finals in, in such a prestigious competition. Um, it sends a, a shiver down my spine. The players came on and everybody stood up and cheered them on. My dad says that it, it might take me to the final, final if we get through. And I really wanted them to get through. Unbeaten in 11 previous games, Argentina were billed as favourites. We should try to forget about the past and focus on football. This is what is important to us. We knew this was a very special day for Argentina. It is a brilliant experience for me every time I wear the Argentina shirt. It is the greatest moment of my career. Lo máximo, seguramente es algo que no me olvidar nunca. You couldn't see any signs that there was nerves, or you couldn't see any signs that there was sort of dread amongst the players that it might go wrong. And I think Hoddle has to take praise for that. He had convinced them that they were the best in the World Cup, and he had convinced them to go out as a unit to win the game. The England-Argentina game to me was the climax. This was when, you know, we were really in... To, we, I know, being Swedish, you know, England, supporting England was obviously not just second best. I mean, I feel very anglicised myself, so I assume my Englishness in that respect. And there was, a, there was a tremendous buzz, a very happy buzz, not a, not a threatening buzz at all. After days of speculation and hype in the world's media, the hopes of England and Argentina now focused on the performance of the 22 players on the pitch. It was time for battle to commence. From kickoff, the pace of the match was electrifying. Both teams created early chances, and then, with only six minutes on the clock, disaster struck for England. And Simeone, and down he goes into penalty. The Danish referee was in no doubt about Seaman's foul, but Diego Simeone was. Then una pelota ya perdida, que yo lo veo a Seaman. It was a lost ball. Simon couldn't reach the ball. I realized this and kept on running. What a mistake from the goalkeeper. When you're playing in a World Cup and South American players, you know that you know they would turn that sort of situation into their advantage, and uh, and they did. Gabriel Batistuta was already equal top scorer with four goals. If he knocked this one in, it would put him on top of the world. The whole place went quiet as far as England was concerned because it had been very, very noisy, lots of singing, and it went really quiet, you know, but so quiet at our end. We thought, this is not good, this is really not good.
when, when he scored the first goal, uh, I say myself, of course we can beat them. Oh, I got crazy. I got crazy. Atistuta, I know he went up to the crowd pretending to rock a baby because I think he, his wife just had a baby. And I remember that distinctly. I was thinking, oh, never. One nil down and I think, what, ten minutes gone? And he says, all right, that's England, we're out now. Because, like, you know what England are like, they, <laughs> they can mess it up straight away. It was early in the game, so we knew we had time to get back into the game. That, that was the uh, uh, good thing about it. It would have been a different story if it was like, you know, 85, 86 minutes gone and, you know, he had a few minutes to go. When the match restarted, England played to the limit, constantly probing to find cracks in the Argentine defence. A few minutes later, Owen's running with the ball, and like when, whenever we're running with the ball, everyone's sitting with the friends and family, like going crazy. And Owen with a little bit of space, and two to his right. This is Michael Owen, he goes down and that's a penalty. What happened was that the Argentine player tried just with a small push to bring Owen out of his run, uh, to disturb his run, and it was the reason for the penalty. Maybe the ref realised he made a mistake on the Argentinian penalty, and uh, he was waiting for the time someone from England have a chance to uh, get a fault. In the, in the box, Argentinian box, to, to whistle a penalty as well. Um, no, I mean, in my opinion, the Argentine one was a penalty and the English one wasn't. I mean, I think Owen is a, Owen's a diver. I mean, by, of world-class proportions. Um, but of course, it, at that time, it was politically incorrect to say so. Dive or not, the penalty was awarded and up stepped England's captain courageous. Well, it is a pressurised situation, believe it or not, and you do feel uh, do feel one or two nerves then, I'd be lying if I said otherwise. Um, but you, you've got a chance to, to make a name for yourself and you've got a chance to put your name in a little bit of history. How England need it now. It's Shearer and it's 1-1. Shearer bangs it away, superb. Crowd were up again, went crazy. I was ecstatic because I, you know, I, I thought it was paying them back for 1986 with uh, Maradona. When it's such a big game and you know that you haven't started that well and you're one nil down and you you really do need that and it you know when it when it goes in it, you know, it's such relief it really is. <laughs> On equal terms again, England took the initiative and pushed forward. They were led in a tank by England's youngest ever striker, 18-year-old Michael Owen. You could see the fear of the Argentinian players every time Michael got the ball because he was absolutely destroying them with his pace. And, and the coach, um, Passarella, was out on the touchline uh, and he, scratching his head, didn't have a clue how to combat young Michael that day. Then, with only 16 minutes gone, came one of the most glorious moments in English football.
and he scored that goal. Everybody just thought, what would we do without him? He's brilliant. I went with my brother, he's exactly the same age, you're thinking, my brother, he can't kick a football to save his life, and then Mark Ryan scored the, one of the best goals in the World Cup ever. Beckham got the ball, poked it through to Owen. Owen, great first touch, and then there was no stopping him. He just went past two defenders as though they weren't there, and we thought that was brilliant, but his finish was just unbelievable. Probably one of the highest moments I've ever had watching England, if not the highest. It was almost like a supernatural experience. I mean, that doesn't happen in World Cups. The last time a teenager made such an impact on a World Cup was Pele, the greatest player of all time in 1958. So uh, it, it was something special, not just because of the goal, which would have been a great goal had Maradona scored it, which he would have been proud to have done, but because it was scored by our 18-year-old. In just 25 steps, Michael Owen guaranteed himself a place in the history books and in the hearts of the nation. We started shouting and he came running across towards where all the friends and family were sitting like this, holding his hands like this. It was, it was a moment I'll just never forget. You know, he he scored such a fantastic goal. I mean, I was I was so proud. You know, I think everybody was proud of him. You know, um, just for that one moment. It proved that the boy has got nerves of steel, ice cold. So many players in that sort of situation. They kind of pulse rate shoots up and they kind of freeze and they think, my God, I'm going to score and it's easier not to. But it shows what a cool customer he is and of course it made him a superstar there and then. When, when we'd gone ahead 2-1, I, I was convinced then that there was no way back for the Argentines and, you know, and that we would end up uh, convincing winners. Argentina who hadn't conceded a goal in their previous eight matches. I'd just let in two in six minutes. But they were not a team who'd give in easily. What followed in the remaining first half was some of the most compelling football ever. Paul Ince, well struck! And here's Paul Scholes arriving! What a good chance! It was a turning point in the game for me when we were 2-1 up and Paul Scholes missed what for him was a simple chance. And had he scored to make it 3-1, I think we would have gone on to win the game easily because the Argentinians were petrified of Owen and 3-1, they, they wouldn't have come back and our confidence was so high at that point. The crowd was kept on tenterhooks as the pendulum swung back and forth. Each attack was followed by counter-attack. But if England could hang on to their one-goal lead into half-time, they would gain a major psychological advantage. I thought it was finished. 2-1, end of the story. Come back, everybody happy. Really, to be honest, I, I was sure about this. And I make a big mistake. With only a few seconds of normal time left in the first half, England conceded a free kick on the edge of the penalty area. With Batistuta's lethal right foot, it was a dangerous moment for Hoddle's men. Argentina went into a huddle to discuss the free kick. And, you know, it was quite a long gap between getting it, setting it up. It was longer than normal and you could see that I thought, well, what are they going to do? Because they're not going to kick this into the wall. What are they going to do? La pelota le iba a patear Batistuta. Después hablando y bueno. Batistuta was going to take the kick, but after talking to the bench, we changed our minds. El banco suplentes y bueno, cambiamos idea ahí. The plan the Argentines had been secretly practicing for weeks was that Javier Zanetti would hide behind the wall during the setup. 
Then, as Batistuta made a dummy run, Zanetti would peel off to the right, take the ball from Veron's pass and strike. That was the theory. Now, they had to execute that plan in front of a billion staring eyes. Looks like Batistuta, but in fact it is Veron. It's cleverly worked, it's Zanetti! And it's 2-2! There was an explosion of happiness. We were crying, we were laughing. There was a lot of mixed emotions. It will take me more than a year to express it. It's really difficult to explain. It was a superb piece of football. They absolutely deserved the goal. And, you know, while our hearts sunk, we also applauded it because we could see it for its merit. It was a bitter, bitter pill to, to swallow and one that really hurt us badly. And walking back down the tunnel when the ref uh, blew his whistle, my first impressions, I was furious. I was furious, but I didn't want to go in there um, with a real negative. The Argentine fans continued their carnival throughout half-time. I was all the time thinking about, we're going to win. We're going to beat them. It should be difficult, but it should be possible. Having lost their one goal advantage, the English fans knew their team had to do it all again. Come on, England! Well, we were saying that, uh, look, we gave ourselves a mountain to climb, we climbed the mountain, we got in front, and we were the better side. And, and uh, we were very, very disappointed to have lost that goal just before half time. But, on the other hand, we've played like that in the first half, why can't we go on that, like that in the second half and, and put in a similar kind of performance? We still thought the way England were playing with Michael Owen and Shearer, we could go on and win the game quite easily. And then it, it must have been, it only seemed like seconds after the kickoff, uh, the Beckham incident came, came along. Bex went to chest it and uh, I mean, it was a dreadful tackle. I mean, the, they could have been studded, you know, in the back. While Beckham's lying there face down, he ruffles his hair. And that was what really, really annoyed Beckham. And almost as an afterthought, really, Beckham kicks out. Simeone says, thank you very much. Then there was a few players around the referee, I think Batistuta again, the old, you know, he should be booked, sent off trying to provoke trouble. The yellow card then came out for Simeone, correctly. When it happened, uh, the emotion and the feeling was, you know, what have you done that for, David? But it was a yellow card. Even he hasn't hit him, uh, it was uh, violent conduct because the law says attempt to kick in the player or kick in the player is the same. Both situations is the red cards. Gestos, eh, que, que los árbitros... These are actions that referees think are intentional, the intention of doing harm. In reality, Beckham didn't do anything. Wait a minute, he's taking another card out for Beckham, it's a red card for David Beckham. I was very happy because he plays really well. So that it's like getting rid of an important player in the English team. So I was very, very happy. We were disappointed that he did that, but you know, I'm, I'm no angel myself, so I, I can't comment on what somebody does in eight of a moment because I've done silly things like that, and, and Dave knew it were, were a bit silly, but. Uh, you know, at the, at the time he did it, I thought it's got to be a red card, and, and so it proved to be. I had feelings for Beckham in, in the dressing room because when you've got 20 people in there, the team, the squad, the manager, the coach and everything, there's huge camaraderie and people shout and shake fists and everything. When you go back on your own and there may be one member of Hoddle staff there saying, don't worry about it, Dave, and he sits down, his head in his hands, he doesn't want to take his boots off, his shirt off, you know, the bath might not be run, he doesn't know what to do. 
he would have felt embarrassed for him, for Hoddle, the other players and the country in general. After Beckham went off, we saw one aspect of the very best of Glenn Hoddle. In a moment of real crisis for him, as the director of this England team, he was superb. And in particular, an instruction to the strikers to alternate as lone striker. Me and Michael kept uh, kept swapping. One would go up front, and the other one would go on the uh, on the right hand side. Straight away, I was moved into a more central role. We knew then that we were going to have to dig in and you know just battle and scrap for everything. Roll up my sleeves and let's go. Let's keep one going. You know, I looked around. I looked around at the pitch, and I thought, yeah, you know, we, we still had a strong side. I saw no heads drop. It was you know stick stick your chest that time. But the defending in the game was unbelievable, especially when we were down to 10. It was incredible. Some of the tackles the boys at the back were putting in. I mean, um, a lot of the people in the, in the crowd actually respected that, you know, the way we, we were resilient throughout the game. What followed was one of the most impressive rearguard actions since Rogue's Drift. I thought that was absolutely compelling part of the drama because Argentina basically had possession, they had the initiative, and they had to use their extra man to outmaneuver England and pass through them. But what happened was that they just kept passing in front of England. Gallardo, Veron, back with Gallardo, around Adams, and blocked by Campbell. Here we say they have balls. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but the truth is they've got such a strong fighting spirit. The way they, they kept at it, uh, our defence was, was magnificent. Um, Shearer played played deep, and I think Owen kept kept coming back as well and helping out. And everyone just sort of mucked in. And it was Alan Shearer who kicked away from underneath his own crossbar. The longer it went on, the more confident all the fans were getting. The Argentinians, I think they couldn't believe they, they probably thought themselves, well, down to 10 men, it's only a matter of time, but it just went on and on and on. And I think they were losing heart a bit. They couldn't believe how well the England, certainly the English defence and the midfield were playing. You could see their shoulders drop and their heads drop. And you could see them saying, you know, we aren't going to get through here. From the moment that they were down to 10 men, it was just so obvious that the fans were in no way going to let the team get away with losing. They were going to boost them. And I kept thinking, they'll tire. They'll tire in a minute, the fans. You know, they'll get fed up of it. No, no, no. They just kept coming up with new things. And if I'd been a player on that pitch, I mean, that would have lifted me no end. The England supporters there were fantastic. You know, we, we did try to uplift the team. right up the back where he was and they banded right next to us and we could hear him straight in our ear and was singing along with him on all the songs. What they do do is that constant playing and the constant playing meant that the fans were constantly singing. I've never heard support like it. The England supporters band had followed the team to all the World Cup fixtures but it was at this one that they became national heroes. Did the great escape from start to finish just to keep the crowd going and all that because everybody just really cheered on that song and it was brilliant. We gave it everything and, and we couldn't believe the, the response to it to be honest because in all the other games up to it, it had sort of, there were pockets who knew it and it didn't seem to spread but it just clicked, it just, it just went and it was, 
it was amazing that. There was a general feeling amongst the supporters that there's no way we were going to be outshouted and there's no way that we were going to be anything other than right behind our, our team giving them everything. You become part of the of this crowd so to speak you don't be you're not like a separate person I mean that's the whole idea of going to a football match like this really is that you are part of the crowd you're not an outstanding person in the crowd whoever you are Post sense that you know we needed that lift as well. We were, you know, a man down, and we needed all the help we could get. And uh, they, they certainly, you know, gave it everything, just just as we did. We went there to ten men, but we we, we still had kind of uh, some chances here and there, you know, where you know we were getting kind of shots in or crosses or whatever. Where if something else happened, it, it could have been a goal. Darren took the corner. He's, he's uh, whipped it in, and uh, it's, it's it's coming across. You know, there's a pile of bodies jumping up for the ball. I've actually seen the ball kind of go over the actually keeper's head, and, and I've kind of you know put my head on, head on it. Once I saw that ball winning, I was just off. I'm just shutting my eyes, shouting, and you know, loads of emotions are just going through my mind, and I just, I just can't believe it. For me, having spent six, seven years with him, helping him through his career to see him score a goal in the World Cup, I was in shock. You know, people were just saying to me, "So scored, so scored." And that was the moment that England were going to win the World Cup. I mean, if only we, we only had to beat Holland and, you know, we only had to beat Brazil and perhaps France or something. We definitely won the World Cup at that point. I was just about to do my lap of uh, honour around Saint-Étienne Square and uh, just before I turned away, I just saw that they were playing on again all of a sudden. It was too fast to be a kick-off. At first, I didn't think it was a foul. In truth, I thought it was a goal. Half the England team were celebrating off the pitch. So I grabbed the ball, put it down, and played really quickly and counter attack. And I could see them going ahead and scoring. I mean, it was bad enough having 10 men, but we only had five, I think, uh, to defend against. It was an incredible feeling. It just all changes, you know. You know, you look around, and like you know, the Argentinian players are going and attacking, and you know, from ecstasy to to down to the gutters in 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 seconds. and joking it was I can't believe it no he's not allowed it why not and what was the reason I think it was a free uh, clear free kick from Alan Scherer uh, it was a uh, clear uh, header to the goal but the difference was the goalkeeper was kept away by the elbow from uh, Alan Scherer and then this is the reason for the free kick I've kept my eye on, on the ball all the time and the keepers come out and uh, we've collided I've looked at the referee and uh, He's given a, a free kick against me. Some you get, some you don't, but it's a contact sport. In my opinion, it wasn't a free kick, but in, in, in his opinion, which is the most important one, it was, unfortunately for us. It's a turby game, really. It's, it was amazing. It was just up and down and all around. With only moments of normal time left, Hoddle was determined that his team didn't repeat the same mistake as in the first half. Anderton's kick. There is Sol Campbell. By the end of the 
the second half, once once we played with ten men for forty five minutes, I thought that we we'd still go on and win the game. Having held the Argentines at bay with only ten men, the lion hearted spirit was still riding high. It's quite funny, I was I was still quite, you know, still quite fresh. You know, I had a lot of energy in me and I thought, yeah, I can, you know, keep on going, you know, as if I was running on adrenaline. It was, it was very, very emotional time. I think the fans started doing the national anthem again. It was, it was amazing. To... Within moments of restarting, Darren Anderton was substituted for David Batty. I was absolutely shattered and, I, and I'd given it my all. I mean, I, I knew that I probably could have gone on, but uh, at that stage, I mean, you're playing with one man down and you need everyone spot on. I'd been on bench sat down for, say, a quarter of an hour and I was that keen to, to not miss out on an England cap. No? I just told Gaffer that I warmed up, I hadn't even had a, any sort of warm up, so I just stripped my top off and I was straight on and, and our lads were like laughing in that. It was terrible on every level at the extra time because everyone was tired, I mean the crowd was tired, we were all hoarse and the players were obviously tired and they couldn't really hack it. We were physically drained and physically and mentally tired. But on the other hand, uh, they weren't really causing us too many problems. There was always a chance that we could go upfield and, and, and break on them. And as it happens, we, we did have one or two opportunities to do that. Not great chances, but I suppose half chances, if you like, to, to break and, and score a goal. Play on, says the referee. It's Paul Ince. Around where we were watching it, it's got a bit rowdy. A couple of glasses were being dropped at the back and all of a sudden, uh, the bloke whose bar it was, he pulled the plug on the TV. So it left all the English. Stood there, no telly, going into the second half of extra time. So everyone just panicked. Where should we go? So we all scarped, trying to find the next bar. And we saw loads of people running into this bar. So we thought, I bet it's on there, obviously. Um, but, but by the time we got there, the bar inside was absolutely packed. It was full to the rafters. We could just make it out between the heads, because it was up on the, on the wall. So Gaz says to us, going to have to get on my shoulders and you'll have to tell me what's happening. So I got on top of Gaz's shoulders and he was commentating and everyone's shouting to me, hey Dave, what, what, what's going on? So I'm going through extra time with him, um, near misses and whatever. He certainly wasn't John Motson. He wasn't very good. Come to final whistle, uh, penalties. Everybody were waiting for the final whistle. Come on, ref, come on, ref. For the end of the game. Since 1990, England had lost two out of three penalty shootouts. Surely, this time, fortune had to favour them. I've been a witness to England's penalty shootouts, and when the pressure's on, it's the most fantastically difficult thing to do, but England do not seem to do this the best. It's not their forte, the penalty shootouts. So, I wasn't, like, 100% hopeful about this. No, no hay, digamos, no, no hay otra solución. There is no other solution. We could have played all day and nobody would have scored. When it came to it, I, I can't remember whether straight away I thought, yeah, I'm going to be on to take a penalty and I'm going to take it, or whether it was when Glenn Oddle came and asked who wanted to take one, but I said yes straight away. And then they would decide who would take the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and, and the gaffer decided I'd take the last one. Ince is strong, strong character, I felt, you know, and he said straight away, no, I'm up for this. So I was very pleased with the five that we had. I certainly would have practiced penalties, and I cannot believe that even the day before um, going into a sudden death game, or even at some stage during our build-up, we didn't practice penalties. You can never reproduce the atmosphere and the pressure. I mean, I, c I could score, go score penalties in training, no problem, because the, the pressure uh, is off you. You know, you, you can play somewhere you want, you can, you can kick them with your left foot and, and score. You know, from the outside looking in, I can appreciate people saying, well, why, why are they not better prepared? He 
it's great for goalkeepers. They're not really expected to save them. There's not, you know, like people think, oh, no, he must be so nervous, stood there, and, you know, the guy's going to shoot. And you think, well, you know, yeah, I, I quite fancy this. I honestly thought that there was no way that David Seaman was going to face five penalties and not save one. I could not believe that they would score with all their penalties. You just sit there and you just wheel that ball in the net. You just remain positive and you just send as much positive sort of thoughts you can to your player. I always thought, really, if I can put it in the same spot as I've, uh, as I've put it in the first one, then he's not going to save it. And, like, my heart was going boom, 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 boom. I was like, I didn't want to look, but I know I had to look. Then David Seaman put England ahead with a great save from Crespo's shot. Victory was there to be taken as Paul Inns stepped forward. You more or less guess it from how they stand, how they position the ball, and from there you gauge which corner they're aiming for. I was calm. I didn't think of the worst scenario. I just concentrated on doing the best I could. It's a situation you're in, a situation that you're faced with is, is, is I think, the biggest problem uh, against Argentina in the World Cup with millions and millions of people watching on television. And you put that penalty in, uh, otherwise England are going out with the biggest competition in the world. Me and Michael were having a chat and, and, and a laugh, really. I, just, I was just trying to, to calm him down because, uh, and he's turned around and said to me, uh, what shall I do? And I've just turned around and I said, do what you normally effing and do and, and put it in the back of the net. If he step forward, I think, was a ball is in, in his head because it's most important to be uh, to be able to uh, to go on the penalty spot, kick the ball, and score. Then when Batty stepped up, we thought, "Hang on, this is tricky. This is tricky." I was taking that pen, knowing that there were 21 lads urging me on to do well, and all the staff, which. Uh, what a nice thought to have, you know, and all those people back home, which probably give me the confidence to take it in first place. Every moment that I knew we were out, I was I was shocked because I never thought it was going to happen. I really felt confident that we were going to we were going to go through. We, we gave it our best shot. That's the thing, we all chipped in and gave it our best shot. And uh, you can't really ask more from, from, from those players, from the manager, from, from anyone connected with uh, England. The crowd were just brilliant as well. It was all, it was all like big friends and you just knew that you were going to get on with every single um, crowd in there. been my dream to play in a World Cup and you know to, to play in a World Cup final and I, I really believed that you know that we were going to not because it was a dream but because you know I thought we were good we were good enough. 
I was just thinking that should be us and I wish it had been us. I mean, I see them celebrating down at the other end, that's what I was doing and just staring into to space really thinking um, that should be us down there celebrating now, but it isn't and what, we, what am I going to do now? We got crazy, we started to jump everywhere. It was beautiful and we were so, so happy that we couldn't speak. People weren't, weren't really talking to each other. Um, everyone just left, there. people were just so deflated. I've never seen anything like it really, it was, it was dreadful. I lost for words. I really, really choked. I absolutely gutted. I, I've never felt so. I don't know. You know, you just sat alone. <laughs> Everything was going on around. You just looked at the Argentinians, and, and it was just like, oh. Every one of us was just completely gutted, as if as all the blood had drained out of our bodies. We we'd got no heart left. Uh, we was we were in a way subdued, you know. Uh, I cried. I should have prefaced all this by I really don't know much about football, which is, I guess, pretty obvious. But um, for the for the actual atmosphere and excitement, it's certainly up there with any sporting event that I've been to. Uh, from my own per, you know, personal excitement and the excitement of everyone else that was there and everyone I spoke to afterwards and in England, I think it was one of the most exciting games I've been to. I'm a burning effigy of everything I used to be You're my rock of empathy, my the most positive thing to come out of it was that you looked at them and you thought, hey, they could win this. One thing you guarantee when you're, you're English or when you're playing English side is that you're going to be in for one hell of a game. We were there to get behind England and those fans I can't say enough about them. They were absolutely terrific. Look me up in the yellow pages. I will be a rock of ages. See through fats and your crazy faces. Yeah! Little Bo Peep has lost his sheep. He popped a pill and fell asleep. The chew is wet, but the grass is sweet. My dear! Your mind gets burned with a habit you've lost. But with a generation that's gotta be her. I'm not so sure whether I'll, I'll be spending all that money to go and watch England again. Maybe I will just take the easy option and go down the pub. I had a taste of it and uh, I quite like the taste and uh, obviously you want, to, you want a bit more. I enjoyed it every, every minute of it, even the, even the miss I've enjoyed it. It's, it's the pinnacle of anyone's career performing in the World Cup. I think the nation were proud and certainly the players and everybody, everybody involved uh, could, could certainly feel proud of what they'd done for the country that night because it was a titanic battle. I'm just so glad that I went and actually saw England play and really brilliant. If England get there then I, I, might, I might be going to, um, to Holland and certainly to Japan. I've got a friend who lives out there so I'm definitely going to Japan, no, no problems about that.